Today guys, we're going to be doing a video a little differently. I've been getting a lot of requests on how to become a chef and today we're going to talk about this topic. Hopefully a lot of this will be relevant to you and also be helpful if you are considering starting in the culinary world. And if you know someone that wants to become a chef, then by all means share this video with them and hopefully it will help them. So before we get going today, be sure to share, like, and subscribe, and let's get started. What's the best way on becoming a chef or how to get into the culinary industry? If you're about 17 or 18 and you still don't have like, like a really clear idea on what you want to do yet, then I would suggest getting a part-time job or a full-time job in summer or when you're off from school in the best restaurant that you can get into, even if you're washing dishes. It should be the restaurant that's closest to you, a local restaurant so you're not commuting and so it's not a lot of extra stress. Now, why do I say even washing dishes? Because one, being a chef normally, the old way, the old method of becoming a chef, you started in the dish pit washing dishes, I did. Not only will you see how a real kitchen works, the chef's making all the mise en place, the orders going out, the wait staff, you'll see how actual kitchen works and operates, but you also be exposed to if you want to continue working in say a fine dining restaurant or if you want to work in pastry because if you're in a fine dining restaurant more often than not they'll have their own pastry department not every place does and this is a completely different world compared to the normal kitchen the other thing is that it will also give something to put on your resume or your cv and if you did a good enough job and if the restaurant likes you they may actually give you an apprenticeship or ask you to stay on and hire you. So it could be another foot in the door. Now again, fine dining is not for everyone, but it will at least give you an idea if you like fine dining and if you don't, that's fine. There are plenty of other types of restaurants. Fine dining is not for everyone. Fast food is not for everyone. You may be happier in a normal restaurant where it's a little quieter, less mise en place, and you have to see for yourself when you start working. Now, if you're sure on what you want to do or dead set on becoming a chef or getting in the culinary industry, then you still don't have to spend the money on going to a university or a cookery school. Some of the Michelin star places or fine dining places will still give you a full apprenticeship where they will pay for room and board, you will be working a lot of hours, and more than likely you will not get paid because you're there to actually learn. It's there to go on your CV as experience and it's there for you to develop skills. Now again, this is not quite common. You actually have to apply at the restaurant and you will have a better chance if you apply at Michelin star restaurants compared to a normal restaurant because Michelin star one, they charge more, they pay more, in theory, they pay more. Two, they typically also have a lot more apprentices to do all the little fine detail work for the chefs instead of a normal restaurant. The other option, instead of going through the apprenticeship route, is to go to a cookery school or a university. Now, the best cooking university in the United States is the CIA. It's one of the best, the Culinary Institute of America. It's also one of the most expensive. There are many other cheaper options or other places that you can learn how to cook. It doesn't just have to be the best. You can also go to Le Cordon Bleu, which is quite famous, especially over here. And there are many other cooking schools. And I'm sure, depending on where you live, you should have a few options locally. Now, the whole point of the university or cookery school is to develop the basic skills that you will need in becoming a chef, depending on which program you choose, obviously. And some will also make you do an apprenticeship. Like when I was in Hotel Arts, we had a lot of apprentices but I will give you a few options down below if you want to check out, say, Le Cordon Bleu or the CIA, so you can read up on it yourself, and if you want to pursue it, then by all means, go for it. What to expect when becoming a chef? Now, there are a lot of things that you're not going to get, like reality. You're gonna have a reality check if you watch TV. It's not all glamour, it really isn't. Very few chefs make it to become a celebrity chef, and even then, it's still not an easy life to work your way up the ladder to get to that point. So we're going to talk about a few things here, and if there are any other chefs watching this, then please share your experiences down below. When working your way up the ladder and you're getting more experienced and everything, and it starts as early as being a kami, which is the basic cook, um, expect to work very long hours. Depending on, of course, where you work, what restaurant you're in, um, a lot of things, depending on the place, the country, you will be working more or less hours and also having more or less holidays. But if you think that a 50 hour work week is bad, 
uh, that's nothing. Especially over here in Europe and I'm sure in other places as well, you will be working 70, 80, 90 hours or even more a week. And I'm not joking, this is not something that you will see on TV and if you think it's all peaches and cream, it isn't. Expect to work holidays, expect to work weekends. Basically, expect not to have, if you're working in a busy place, much time to yourself. Now, of course, when you work your way up the ladder, the situation may change and again, depending on if you get another job in another place, it's not always the same. Now, the salary is another subject. When working your way up the ladder, you will be earning more money. In some places, you may be earning tips as well. Now, some chefs make more than others, and again, depending on the place and your level as well, if you're the chef de cuisine, if you're the executive chef, you'll make a lot of money. But for the average chef or sous chef, and you put in 80, 90 hours of work, and you have to know, you have to have a lot, you have a lot of responsibilities, you have to know a lot of things, you can't get people sick, for the amount of work that we do put in and working holidays and missing family time there is it is tough it is tough so again this isn't true for everyone some people do have very cushy and nice positions and others not so much cooking or chefing in general is a very stressful career it's not just physical stress it's also mental stress um, expect to be standing on your feet the entire time that you're working I mean, literally running. I would actually prefer running instead of just standing in one spot preparing mise en place because your legs get tired. Um, after a while, you'll be so tired that you will start making mistakes. So it's very important to have some sort of stress relief because after working like four or five double shifts, trust me, you need some sort of stress relief. Binge drinking is not necessarily a good thing, but you need to find something, whether it's karate, uh, exercising, yoga, meditating, whatever it is, reading a book, uh, going for a walk, well, maybe not after working so much, but anything, you need to find a way to release your stress. Because at the end, you will either break, and I have seen a few chefs break during service, or you will become numb. And I was in a very busy restaurant, so this is a bit of a unique situation, but I have seen a few cooks, as when I was on the line working, all of a sudden just stop, break down in tears and literally quit the job and walk off mid-service. So this isn't that common. I mean, I haven't seen it that much, but it does happen. Cooking allows you, if you have the means or if you want to, to travel. And this is what I have done. I've worked now in four countries. And the one thing I will say is that not every country is the same. Some countries will have more work hours weekly work hours, some less, some more holidays, some less. But if you do work internationally, if you're an apprentice, more than likely they will speak English to you in the kitchen. If you're working in another country and you're an actual cook, a chef, a chef de pâté, sous chef, you need to learn the other language you have to. And some countries, like I said, do have less work hours than other countries. France is only 35 hours a week. And actually they're pretty strict with that, even in the kitchen. Now, normally though, in England, it's like 48 hours a week, in America, it's 40. Don't expect this to actually correlate with uh, the culinary industry. But in France, it can. It does pretty much correlate. They forced me to stop working a few times because they said, no, James, 35 hours, you're done, go home, go home. They're very strict in some places. Now, after all this, if any of you still want to uh, start chefing and cooking, there is a few things that I would suggest. When apprenticing, and in the United States, even when cooking, normally the kitchen already has the kitchen knives. You don't need to buy a set of knives. Now, this isn't true for everywhere. In Europe, even when apprenticing, you're expected to have your own knives with you. So if you are gonna work in Europe or apprentice, then I would suggest buying a few different knives. And I have a uh, video on that as well, on some basic culinary instruments, which I'll leave down below if, um, if you want to check that out. But you need to have a few things to help you work in the kitchen. You need to listen to everything that your chef tells you and you need to follow his instructions. You need to remember the instructions. So I would suggest getting a little notebook and a pen or a pencil and literally writing down absolutely everything. Now, when I say you need to do everything that your chef says, in some places it's more true than others. In the UK, the chef is like God again, depending on the kitchen, but uh, the places that I've worked, 
you do not talk back to the chef. It's we chef, that's it. You do exactly as he says. Writing down everything will help you not only do good in the kitchen, they'll like you more when you remember and you actually work well, but it'll help you to remember the mise en place. It'll help you to develop better skills. For example, if they say that you need to cut the, the onions two millimeters on the deli slicer to make some crispy onions, you cut them two millimeters. I mean, there are things that you need to write down. When you're plating, if you're gonna be plating dishes, take a photo write down what goes on the plate, every single ingredient, how many carrots, how many pieces of broccoli, etc. how many ounces of rice. All these things are important and you need to remember them. One thing I can't stress enough is that when in doubt, always ask. Either ask your chef, ask your sous chef, the chef de pâté, ask somebody that knows that's been there longer than you because it's better to ask and do it correctly than to do something wrong and mess up and then you're basically in hot water. So when in doubt, always ask. You need to think about, do I wanna work in a restaurant or do I wanna work at a hotel? In the end, it's about job security because hotels have more than one source of income and you also typically have catering with them. So you have more options. And if you actually work for a big chain, a big company, say the Four Seasons or Marriott or anything like this, you can transfer. And my last advice, guys, is that, again, when interviewing, this could be a whole nother video and I'm not gonna go into great detail, but you need to look your best, you need to be clean cut, shave, um, wear not a suit necessarily, but wear nice pants, shoes, a tie, shirt, things like this. Be presentable, have an idea as well, have some questions. How many meals a day do they put out? What's the turnover rate as well in the kitchen? Because if you go to a place, and I've been to a lot of interviews, and you see that the turnover of the kitchen, the staff, is more than 50% a month, those are some telltale signs that it may not be such a good place to work, at least not for you. The other thing to ask if you're working over here in Europe especially is to ask if it's a full shift or if it's coupure or split shift, because a lot of places are split shift. Some places, especially here in Spain, they will only give you one day off. Or if they say they give you two, they will tell you something like this, like you work a half day, which is eight hours on Monday, and you work a half day, which is eight hours again on Saturday. And then Sunday is a whole day. So they put the two half days together. And they say that's a full day for the time that you're off. And then Sunday you're off. It's two full days. So again, depending on the place that you are, you need to ask a lot of questions. So hopefully guys, I've given you a few ideas. If you had a few questions about becoming a chef or just starting in the industry, I will say though that just this video alone shouldn't determine whether you want to or not. You should actually at least get your foot in the door, work a little bit in a restaurant to see if you do like it because every place is different and you may like it. You may really enjoy it. And if you do, you may make a career out of it and be very successful. So any case guys, if you have any questions or comments, right down below. Hopefully you liked this video and if you did then share, like and subscribe uh, for somebody else that it may be useful for and I will see you guys again very soon. Until then, take care.